where the two come into loggerheads at this council here. Attendance was initially very poor, just as at Pavia, and Eugenius IV, who was very suspicious of what was going to happen here, jumped at the opportunity and said, oh, just like Pavia, this one's closed, this one's over, no one's interested, and um, before the letter could actually get there and be read, the um, other attendees, uh, bishops particularly from France, um, got wind of what this was going to happen, and they refused to, let, to let, let this letter be read and to listen to it. And they continued to hold their meetings in open defiance, saying that, well, the council has more authority than uh, the pope, and we're not just not going to listen to it. So there is a period of nearly a year and a half of open rebellion between the two, and the, uh, the council calling for the pope and his cardinals to come and um, answer to the council for what they've been doing and not been doing. Most of the princes are the kings of Europe at this time, and many, the majority of the cardinals were actually in favor of the council uh, relative to the pope. So the pope was not starting off with a great deal of uh, backing in this, uh, in this campaign. And um, by April of 1432, the council uh, had called for the pope and his cardinals to appear. Um, in September of 1432, anytime you let the French French clerics in on um, assemblies, they somehow managed to turn very radical very quickly, and French Revolution start up. Um, and here was almost a precursor of that a few hundred years before. The uh, bishops decided to give theologians and um, doctors of canon law and others equal votes with that of bishops. And before long, almost instantaneously, the bishops were outnumbered, and it didn't matter what they had to say, and there was a much more radical bent to many of these lower uh, clerics and one of the things they wanted to do and promote. So, um, given, the, uh, given the response of the, several of the cardinals and um, some of the Christian uh, princes at the time, Pope Eugenius withdrew that bull that had attempted to close the council. He withdrew it, reopened the council, we might say, and allowed the council to proceed. One of the things that the Council of Basel, while it was there, uh, that it started and helped heal was the um, very wounded feelings with regard to the Hussites, the, the Bohem Christians in Bohemia. Um, after Jan Hus and Jerome of Prague had been executed, the um, Bohemians had gone into outright rebellion and war against the empire, the Holy Roman Empire, the Germans, basically. And in 1433, their leader had come to Basel to kind of um, win uh, some concessions. He did not go alone like Jan Hus, uh, or with, he came with a lot of protection this time, and um, he made four demands. One, that Holy Communion would be extended to the laity under both species. A second, that um, all priests had the right to preach the word of God regardless of location. Uh, the third, he asked for canonical regulations that would forbid clerics from holding any temporal possessions. So um, this is one of the things that he insisted upon. And fourth, and this one, just imagine if this one had, had been um, approved, a declaration authorizing every one of the faithful to punish public sinners with his own hands in accord with his own judgment. <laughs> um, now, this was not; these were not um, approved. The council did not see eye to eye with uh, Procopius on all of these matters. Um, and initially, they went off, but they kept in contact, and they um, managed to work out an agreement with the uh, the church with the Christians in um, Bohemia, what's now the Czech Republic. They said that distribution of Holy Communion under both kinds, so uh, the precious blood and, and, and uh, the body and blood of Christ, are the, um, that that could happen, could take place, if the priest uh, made special effort to instruct the faithful that Christ was fully and equally present under each species. So it's not that you're being cheated out if you only receive under one, that it is fuller sign, but it's not certainly not required. So as long as this instruction was made that people aren't under um, 
a false understanding, then this could take place. Uh, regarding the second demand, uh, the agreement was reached that the priest uh, could preach, but they remained subject to the local bishop. So the authority of the structure of the church, the bishop the one, is the one who is primarily responsible for what is being taught or not being taught, preached or not being preached in his diocese, so he should have a say there. Uh, the third, the, uh, the Bohemians were reminded that both New and Old Testament give rights for people to possess things, own things, and that uh, the clerics had a right to temporal goods, but the church also had the power, has the power to reform abuses, and that this should be taken up, is one of the things. And fourth, they did not agree at all to that fourth uh, demand. Um, they said the rights of, to punish crimes belong exclusively to ecclesiastical tribunals and spiritual matters and civil magistrates or courts in temporal matters. So thankfully we didn't have vigilante, demanding vigilante justice. So uh, vigilante justice was not approved. The council fathers uh, in Basel began to re, then began to reorganize the church as they saw fit. So um, one of the things they did is um, some of the taxes that were going, so a, let's say a parish would have a benefice, so a, par a parish church would have lands attached to it, right, that would be lent out, leased out to farmers, and the um, crops raised could be sold off, and that would be the revenue, the income for the, pre the parish priest. And likewise, there would be similar things for um, on the scale for dioceses and so forth, these lands. And there would be a certain tax placed on that where that tax money would go to Rome to help pay for the curia and the upkeep and these trials and, so, and court life and all that. Well, Basil, the, the, uh, cons the fathers of Basil thought, well, it's time to reform the church and we're going to reorganize it, so that money's now coming here. It's not going to Rome anymore. It's going to come here. You're still paying the tax, but it's not going to Rome. It's coming to Basel. And um, this effectively bankrupt the Pope, cut off his source of funds, and um, that they went um, first to the council. The council also moved that the Pope's name should no longer be mentioned during the Eucharistic prayer, that they were the authority and the Pope was under them. So this, these radical moves were being made. Uh, there was a, card, a French cardinal there from Arles, uh, sought to make the council a permanent corporation, like a setting parliament, and the Pope would kind of be the prime minister. So an attempt to really alter the uh, constitution of the church as it had existed and up, um, up to that point and has uh, to this point um, in time. They also began negotiating with individual princes and making appointments to various ecclesiastical offices, so naming who's going to have that office, who's going to be here. The things that the uh, Roman Curia traditionally had done, they just started to take to themselves. Um, and many of the Christian princes became very suspicious, uneasy with these moves, particularly when they became quite outright that in their views of that the council should continue to set in power and to be of a higher authority than that of the Pope. A number of uh, uh, Christian princes started to back off of their support for it. And uh, the corollary of John uh, 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave uh, to it no committees. <laughs> so uh, Then an unexpected guest arrived, and that was the emperor of Constantinople. John the Eighth, and this provided Eugenius with the opportunity he was looking for to um, grab the council out from the hands of these radicals and move it in a different direction. Just why, so why did John, uh, Emperor John uh, the Eighth, show up at the council to begin with? If we uh, recall from last time or a few weeks ago, um, at the prior. In 1204, the Fourth Crusade had devastated the um, Byzantine Empire. It in, instead of ending up in the Holy Land, it ended up in Constantinople, and instead of re